a small one-bedroom apartment overlooking the new buildings. Average American family, mother, father, two children. The head of the family is tall, black-haired with brown eyes and a strong physique. You can see that he loves himself. Always well-groomed, combed. There's always a trail of men's perfume behind him. In general, the price knows himself. It's a common type of man in big cities, always looking for himself and a better life. His wife Suzanne is the complete opposite, short height, with blonde hair and blue eyes. She doesn't care much about her appearance. She cherishes every minute of her life, does not expect someone to present her everything on a platter. Dakota and Rebecca are their children. They were born a little over a year apart in age. Dakota was five and Rebecca was about to turn four. The children attended kindergarten and a dance studio, and they were handled solely by their mom. Dad thought it was a woman's job to raise the children. The father did not even want to play with them. The children grew up very active and demanded a lot of attention. Suzanne devoted almost all her free time to them, combining home, work, child rearing, shopping. She constantly felt that she did not have enough time for herself. Suzanne worked as an administrator in a children's entertainment center. It was not difficult for her to keep the children entertained. On weekends, she always took a part-time job, provided cleaning services. Suzanne was also very fond of baking. From a young age, she had an interest in confectionery, and she was very good at it. Her hobby gradually turned into an additional income. She baked cakes to order. For his father, Robert, it was the opposite. Children and work. Two concepts incompatible with his plans for life. When his wife had to leave for a part-time job or to the store, and the kids started asking him to play with them, he would think of anything to get them off his back. He'd turn on cartoons, he'd let them play with his tablet. You have a lot of toys. Go out and play with them. I don't like children's games, he often told the kids. The only thing he could do for the kids, some sacrifice on his part, was to take them to the playground near the house. There they would run around and not disturb him. He had always dreamed of a good, secure life, only to have it all come by itself, without any effort, working out to perfect his body at the gym and dreaming of a carefree existence. Suzanne disagreed with her husband on this. She believed that if you have a dream, you should strive for it, not just wait for it, but work hard for it. Suzanne had a dream of opening her own cake shop. She saved the money she made from selling cakes. She thought that in a year or two she would rent some premises, hire an assistant and work for herself. But now she had to work for three people. Suzanne and Robert met in high school. They lived in a village 50 kilometers from the city and dreamed of one thing, to go to the big city. Robert was a nerd, wore glasses, and didn't socialize much. None of the girls in his class liked him, except Suzanne. The boys made fun of him. Although he was a tall and sturdy boy, he couldn't stand up for himself. Susanna even had to defend him a few times. But she was a pretty little girl. Something about her attracted the boys. In high school, they even fought for her attention. No one could understand what she saw in that ugly duckling. Susanna saw him as a beautiful swan. They started dating in 10th grade. They shared a dream of moving to the big city. Suzanne had an aunt on her mom's side who lived in the city. And when she got sick, Suzanne's mom took care of her. She had to leave her daughter, her husband, and a year and a half to care for her sister. The aunt had a son in Canada. But he had neither the ability nor much desire to care for her. After the aunt died, he offered to buy the apartment from him for a token price. The cousin was to come in six months to draw up the inheritance and sell them the apartment in gratitude for his mother's help. Then the chance for Suzanne to get out of the village increased many times over. Suzanne shared this happy news with Robert. He immediately had a plan in his head that he would not have another chance to leave this hole. Therefore, without thinking for a long time, the guy proposed to Suzanne. They were to get married and go to the city to study. Susanna's parents were not against their daughter's early marriage. They themselves got married, barely having finished school, and now for about twenty years have been living soul to soul. No one on Robert's side would have objected. His father in recent years often looked at the bottle after Robert's mother went abroad to work and did not return. The man was slowly drinking himself to death. He didn't care about his son. He was in grief. Only his mother's sister took care of the boy's upbringing, and she herself had three children. Robert liked Susanna very much, but no more. He felt passion for the girl. She was for him a happy ticket to a new life. 
They married in the village. To study in the city came already husband and wife. Passing the examination for admission, Suzanne learned the happy news. She is pregnant. She immediately shared it with her husband. He was shocked, to say the least. What kind of children at that age? Parents supported the girl. Her mother promised to help so that only her daughter had time to get an education. Young people entered the College of Culinary Arts. Suzanne on the pastry chef, Robert on the cook. Studied and lived in the apartment of the late aunt. On the way back from class, the husband struck up a conversation. Suzanne, what do you think? Why do we need a child now? We're still kids ourselves. Let's consider abortion. You what? The girl was indignant. What abortion? First of all, it's too late. And secondly, what if I can never have children again? But understand, it's a burden. We need to get an education, to stand firmly on our feet, and then we can think about children, the boy insisted. So both are to blame and I have to suffer alone? The girl was indignant. All right, don't be so hot. What now? Well then, we'll have the baby. The guy answered her, especially since my mom agreed to help me. And children are not a burden, but a joy, Suzanne said. This attitude of her husband really offended her. How could he suggest killing their child? Didn't he care? Suzanne was outraged. But on the other hand, she understood her husband. The girl calmed down. By the end of freshman year, Dakota was born. The boy was so enamored with everyone that even the resentful husband thawed a little. Suzanne was picked up from the hospital by her husband, her parents, friends, and college classmates. Congratulations. Everyone shouted loudly and launched blue balloons into the sky. Thank you, replied the young mother, happy about the meeting. At home they organized a small party and celebrated the birth of their son. The husband in the first days did not leave his wife and child, and then began to somehow distant. He was very stressed by the presence of his mother-in-law in their house. They continued to study. Suzanne made concessions. She could attend classes selectively. The girl was insanely grateful to her mother. It was not easy to raise a firstborn child. A lot of things you do not know, do not know how to do. Useful advice in this case was very helpful. Robert disappeared after classes until late in the evening. He didn't want to go home. His mother-in-law teaches him. His wife doesn't pay any attention. The baby crees all the time. It was a very stressful environment for him. Robert. Suzanne addressed him. What's wrong? Why are you avoiding me and our son? It's always difficult for young parents at first, but it gets better. It's okay. Her husband reassured her. I just need a little time to get used to my new status. But be patient. Mom's the one who's helping us out. What would we do without her? Suzanne tried to reassure her husband. Suzanne's mother turned a blind eye to many things, but sometimes she could not contain herself and expressed her displeasure to her son-in-law. But he didn't care. He lives in a world of his own, does not notice anyone and nothing around him. Tell me, my dear son-in-law, how many times did you take your son in your arms? The time in the hospital doesn't count. And how many times did you get up at night to soothe the baby? My mother-in-law couldn't keep quiet for long. I didn't count. What's it got to do with you anyway? You volunteered to help your daughter, so help yourself, coldly answered the man. God be with you. I know the answer to that myself. Not once, said the mother-in-law and waved her hand at her son-in-law. Suzanne and Robert successfully passed the summer session. The mother-in-law left for the rest of the summer at her place. For the girl began a difficult period. Her husband was not going to help her. He disappeared all day long. He came home late, sometimes quite drunk. Robert, I don't recognize you. My wife used to say, can't you help me out once in a while? You could take the stroller, take your son for a walk. I could do something and get some rest. It's hard for me to do everything on my own. You're at home, and I'm trying to make useful connections. I've had enough of this poverty. It's time to do something about it. It's impossible to live like this, my husband replied. My mom and dad are helping us with everything. We have enough for now. If you help, I could bake cakes to order. It would be an additional income. You're not looking for a job. That's what the girl said. Once again, I repeat, I make useful connections, meet the right people. It is necessary to enter a certain circle. Then already pierce about the work, answered the angry husband. At the end of July, Suzanne's cousin arrived from Canada. The question of an apartment had to be solved. Her mother and father came from the village. 
At the family council, they decided that it would be better to register the apartment with Suzanne. The parents didn't want their daughter to have to go through the hassle of re-registration after their death. I do not have enough time, so I will try to inherit as soon as possible, and we will conclude the sale, says the cousin. Do as you see fit, Suzanne's mom replied to her nephew. We'll stay here for now. It's a deal, he replied. I'm staying at a hotel nearby. If you have any questions, contact me. I don't need your money. I am grateful to you that you looked after my mother, compensating me for the road and the cost of re-registration, and the apartment is yours. Thank you. Suzanne's parents thanked their nephew profusely. The process took a little over a week. Suzanne became the full owner of the apartment. The cousin went back to Canada. Suzanne's parents reimbursed him for all of his expenses and added some goodies for his family. They found the days spent with their daughter's family unbearable. The son-in-law behaved outrageously and reacted aggressively to remarks. Suzanne's parents had already regretted that they had given their daughter in marriage so early. No one could not think that Robert could turn into such an evil. The father-in-law could barely contain himself from punching him in the face. Daddy, calm down, said an agitated Susanna. It's hard for him right now. He was not ready for fatherhood, has not yet said goodbye to childhood properly. Nothing. He'll get used to it and everything will be fine. It's weird. Usually postpartum depression happens to women. But here it's a man, Mom sneered. What kind of man is he? Just a name. He's making his wife nervous out of nothing. Seriously. He hides his head in the sand like an ostrich. The father couldn't calm down. Parents saw that their daughter loves her husband very much and decided not to interfere. If they started to teach their son-in-law, he would get mad and take all his frustration out on Suzanne. Maybe the daughter is right that he needs time. We'll just have to wait. They didn't know what awaited their daughter after they left. Robert had changed beyond all recognition, as if he were a completely different person. Yes, I'm bad. What am I supposed to be if everybody's not happy with me? I'm negative. No one wants to understand me, not even you, shouted he, coming in late and under the influence of alcohol once again. I don't think so, said a frightened Suzanne. Don't you get enough attention from me? Have you seen yourself in the mirror? You gray mouse. When was the last time you wore makeup? That hastily done hairdo is really pissing me off. I've seen nothing on you but a bathrobe and sweatpants. It's disgusting to look at, husband said and froze, fell on the couch and fell asleep. Suzanne cried half the night and spent the other half soothing the child. She was very hurt. She just didn't have enough time for herself. Obviously, her husband has someone to compare her to. There are plenty of well-groomed women in the big city. Suzanne never wore much makeup, and her hair was very ordinary. Her style of dress was always sporty. For some reason, it suited him in their village, but here it was unacceptable. The next morning, Robert woke up with a terrible headache. Suzanne made breakfast, put on a simple dress, and let her hair down. Are you going somewhere? Her husband asked. Susanna found the question strange. Only the night before he had called her a gray mouse, and now such a question. The girl realized that he did not remember anything from his monologue last night. I'm with this one. He pointed his finger at his son. I won't sit. I'm sick of baby diapers and the constant screaming. I'm not going anywhere. You reprimanded me yesterday but in a rude way about my appearance. I'll try to take better care of myself. But you gotta understand me too. If you'd sit with my son for half an hour in the morning, I'd clean myself up. Then we'd go for a walk together, Suzanne replied. I'm sorry, I had a little too much to drink last night. Without a note of regret, said her husband. I understand you, but you do not want to understand me. In a real family, it should not be like that. Do you agree? The girl said to him. After this conversation, Robert slightly changed his attitude toward Suzanne and his son. Life seemed to start getting better. Her husband began to pay more attention to them. Suzanne even began to work part-time, produced her first cakes to order. The family had money to spare. For the first time in so long, they did everything together. They even managed to go to a cafe a few times. Suzanne was insanely happy. Fall was approaching, the beginning of the new school year. Suzanne's mother was due to arrive any day now. Robert, but try to get along with Mom. She doesn't mean us any harm. Something you badly said goodbye before the vacation. 
the girl asked her husband. I will try, but let your mother and not humiliate me. I was angry for a reason, Robert replied. We had such a good time together. I'm glad you understood me. I'm grateful to you, said Suzanne. My mother-in-law arrived. In the couple of months that she was away, she did not recognize her son-in-law. Her grandson had grown up too. He was very funny. Kids, we're very happy to see you're doing so well, said Mom. You are so good that together survived this difficult time without losing the old feelings. Mom, I'm proud of Robert. He's so good, Suzanne said. It's usually harder for a man to pull himself together than a woman, but he did it. I even went back to baking cakes, remember? I made a little money at it. We went for walks, to cafes, even went to the hospital together. My daughter told me with delight. We had a good walk, and now we need to start studying. Education is very important. Get a profession and get a job. Put Dakota in daycare. That's when you'll be a real independent family, said the happy mother-in-law. And by the winter session, everyone was in for a surprise. Suzanne got pregnant again. This time they were consciously preparing for the birth of a child. Her husband took the news normally. Suzanne's mother understood what was waiting for her, but she was happy for her daughter. The second year was difficult for her. Studying in the first months of pregnancy was simply unbearable. Motion sickness and transport vomited not only from smells but even from the sight of some foods. After the winter session Suzanne was like a squeezed lemon. The worst thing for her was passing an internship in the local canteen. But the girl courageously withstood this test, although she had to turn almost inside out. Dakota was one year old. By this time all the delights of Suzanne's second pregnancy were almost over. She set a fancy table, baked a cake herself, the father and nephews arrived. The child was baptized by Suzanne's old friends Edward and Julia. They had been friends since they were in diapers. Edward was two years older than Susanna, and Julia was in the same class with her. Since Robert had no friends, he relied on his wife to choose godparents for the child. Edward and Julia were both students, with no family of their own yet. Suzanne suggested that they become godparents again, only for their second child. They gladly agreed. Who Robert and Susanna were expecting this time was unknown. It would be revealed at the next ultrasound. This time Suzanne asked Julia to go along with her. The girl wanted to keep the sex of the baby a secret and have a party where it would be announced. Nowadays it was fashionable to hold such events. Edward was very happy for Susanna. She seemed to be happy. Only it seemed to him that the girl had chosen a husband without thinking. He had been talking to Robert for some time, and the latter, a little tipsy, had told him of his true intentions for Susanna. Edward had not dared to tell the girl himself. She would have thought he was jealous of her rather than well-meaning. Suzanne knew she liked Edward, but he was no more than a friend to her. The boy understood that and never once spoke of his feelings. Edward was always ready to help at Suzanne's beck and call. The girl valued this friendship very much. The party was a great success. Suzanne's father at the table turned to his son-in-law. I see you've settled down. Well done. I praise you. Keep it up. I'd like to propose a toast to a good husband for my daughter. Dakota awoke to the clinking of glasses. Suzanne had barely managed to get him to sleep after such a busy day. Surprisingly, Robert got up from the table and said he would handle the baby himself. Dakota calmed down and went back to sleep. Further meetings were held in whispers, without clinking glasses or loud toasts. The guests spent the night at Suzanne and Robert's small apartment. It was difficult to accommodate everyone. Susanna slept on the floor next to the baby's crib. Father, Edward, and Robert slept across the bed in Julia's room, and Mother had the couch in the living room. In the morning, all the guests except Julia left. It was the day of the ultrasound appointment. Robert stayed with his son. The girl went to the clinic. Everything was done as planned. The doctor handed Julia an envelope, which contained information about the sex of the baby, and the girls went home. Robert was waiting impatiently for them. The baby didn't want to obey him at all, refused to eat, threw his toys around and was capricious all the time. If the girls were delayed a little longer, the father of the family could have a nervous breakdown. Suzanne quickly managed to calm her son. Dakota ate and even fell asleep on his own. Julia, I'll get you the money, 
The organization of the party is entirely on your shoulders, Suzanne said to her friend. I'll be happy to organize it. I've heard so much about these gender parties. I'll read more on the internet. I think I can do it. A happy Julia answered her in one breath. It was the day of the last exam of the summer session. Suzanne and Robert prepared for the exam together. The session was closed. Dakota's grandmother was sitting with her, and they had a little time to celebrate the achievement. There was a cozy little cafe not far from the college. Their entire holiday menu consisted of tea and cakes. How nice to spend time together like this, Suzanne said. I don't understand anything. Why the two of us? The husband was surprised. Suzanne looked around involuntarily. It seemed to her that someone was about to join them. Why are you looking around? Robert was surprised again. Is there something I don't know? Suzanne asked in bewilderment. Oh my God, why do you have to be so confused? There are three of us at the table now. Who are you waiting for? Robert laughed. She finally realized what her husband meant and laughed too. There was a surprise waiting for them at home. Julia didn't know for a long time on which day it would be better to hold the gender party. And then the decision came naturally. Robert and Suzanne were not to be home until at least lunchtime. Aunt Dora, Susanna's mother, helped the girl in every way possible. The rooms were decorated with pictures of cartoon characters. On the ceiling were inflated helium balloons of different shapes and colors. Large size confetti was scattered on the floor. The atmosphere was fairy tale like. Dakota sat on the carpet and watched mesmerized. He was very interested in the large, dark bag in the corner of the living room. He tried to get to it time and time again, but he was always getting in the way. Suzanne's father and Edward were the first to arrive. Everything was ready to welcome the celebrants. Edward had bought a huge bouquet of roses which were cleverly hidden under wrapping paper. He took them out onto the balcony and put them in a bucket of water. Suzanne had ordered the flowers. They had to match the color of the secret hidden in the envelope. The girl asked to pack the bouquet so that the one who would pick it up could not see what color they were. Here the door opened. Suzanne and Robert appeared on the threshold. Colorful, glittery ribbons sprinkled on them. The apartment was like a fairy house. Suzanne looked at the pictures on the walls. Robert couldn't take his eyes off the ceiling. I love it. Without holding back her emotions, Suzanne said. A fairy tale. There's no other way to put it, Robert said with the same intonation in his voice. Please come to the table. Julia invited everyone. The table was decorated in pink and blue colors. The cakes and candies, and even the drinks matched the color scheme. Everyone was puzzled. How could everything be so color matched? From the tablecloth on the table of dishes to the sweets and drinks? Julia coped with the mission 100%. Dakota sat in his father's arms and carefully picked alternately pink and blue cream on the cake with his finger. Eventually his hands became party style too. Everyone laughed. It took Robert half a pack of napkins to wipe the beauty off the little hands. Julia asked leading questions. All you had to do to discover the secret was to pay attention and count which questions were more, about girls or boys. Everyone was so engrossed in the game that no one even counted the questions. The mystery remained unsolved. The next contest was to put two stacks from a bag of baby things. Things for a girl and things for a boy. This was to be done by the future grandparents. Once again, it's a mystery. There was an equal amount of stuff. Julia hung blue and pink circles on the walls of the apartment. It was a task for the parents of the future baby. The father had to find and count the pink ones, and the mother, respectively, the blue ones. How surprised everyone was when Suzanne and Robert named the same numbers. You don't seem to want to know the sex of your baby, said Julia, barely containing her laughter. Well, I won't bore you any longer. Edward, get the flowers. Edward came into the apartment from the balcony. He was holding a huge bouquet of roses. Everyone had to take turns tearing off a piece of the wrapping with their teeth. As soon as someone noticed the color of the rose, they had to quietly step aside. By now, everyone was standing back. Everyone eagerly wanted to say that the secret was out. Then suddenly the bag opened as well. A whole bunch of pink balls flew out of it, and everyone shouted, Hooray! A girl! Everyone began to applaud and thank Julia for such a wonderful celebration. Dakota cried again. He was scared. The rest of the time they all talked in whispers and tried not to make any noise. And everyone stayed the night at Suzanne and Robert's house again. In the morning the guests went home. 
What a wonderful party it was, Suzanne said, impressed by the event. Yes, Robert said thoughtfully. The due date was less than a month away. Suzanne couldn't wait. She was suffering from heartburn and her feet were swelling so much that she couldn't even fit into her husband's slippers. The girl's mother had to come to them early. The son-in-law was not very happy about this prospect, but realizing that his wife was almost helpless, accepted it. He did not want to take on himself all the responsibilities of a woman at home. The long-awaited day came. Rebecca was born, and everything happened just as it had after the first birth. Robert was only gone for a couple of weeks at most. He started disappearing at night again, coming home drunk. Susanna understood his condition and didn't make a scene. She asked her mom to be patient, remember what it was like after Dakota gave birth. And then things got better. He needed to relax. Be patient, Mommy. I believe he'll settle down. Oh, daughter, I can hardly believe it. Mom sighed, she said. Robert realized that he couldn't bear to live in such an environment. He went to bars, to clubs. He had no friends in the city, and his family had plenty of money. Children's allowances went entirely to the needs of the kids. Parents bought groceries and paid the rent. Where did he get the money to live a lifestyle of debauchery? Suzanne couldn't figure it out. They had one last year to study. After the third year, they would have to get a grade and could look for a job in their profession. Suzanne was afraid that Robert would drop out. The first semester they still had classes, and after the winter session, there should have been only practice until the defense of the diploma. It became even more difficult for the girl to study. Compared to Dakota, Rebecca was a princess. She was always naughty, she wouldn't let her sleep. At night, she and her mother took turns carrying her in their arms to calm her down. Rebecca's screaming woke up her brother, and he began to support her. Even the strongest of nerves can snap in such an environment, and Robert became very hot-tempered. We waited for the winter session. Suzanne and Robert passed it successfully. Julia decided to lighten the mood before New Year's Eve. She let Aunt Dora go home and stayed at her friend's house for a couple of weeks. Robert began to behave differently when she was a guest. He helped his wife, played with the children, stayed out late and stopped drinking. Susanna could not be happy with her husband, whether Julia had such an effect on him or whether he settled down. You know, Julia, before you came here, my husband was very different, and the girl told her friend about the last months of her life. Susanna, I'm shocked. Why didn't you tell me this before? It's too much to behave like this twice. You have a family, so be kind to be there for both joy and sorrow. Julia resented it. Well, it's just hard for him. We got married early, had kids early. He hasn't had a lot of fun yet, and here is such a load. Suzanne felt sorry for her husband. He's under a lot of pressure? What are you talking about? You're stressed. She had a good point. Last time he turned you into that gray mouse. Headless asshole. Let me talk to him. My friend went on. Don't. Almost begging, Suzanne pleaded. She felt truly sorry for Suzanne and promised to keep this conversation between them. Julia had initially disliked Suzanne starting a relationship with this guy. He was quiet, and that was alarming. But she couldn't change her friend's mind. I had to accept her choice and try to support her. Together they celebrated New Year's Eve. With Julia, Suzanne was much easier. She could tell her absolutely everything. Her friend helped with the children, cooked meals and did the laundry. She encouraged Robert to take action too. Why are you sitting there? There's a whole load of dirty dishes after dinner. On the dishwasher did not earn, then become in mine. Almost in an orderly tone, a Julia said to her friend's husband. For some reason, Robert listened to her and did not interfere. The vacuum cleaner has been broken for a year. If you don't know how to fix it yourself, take it to a repair shop. Nobody's forcing you to buy a new one. 21st century, and you're back to brooms? Ridiculous, Julia continued. Don't push it, Susanna asked. We're a young family. I'm trying to help, and you keep defending him. It's like you're the man of the house, not him. Her friend was indignant. As long as I'm here, I won't keep quiet. I'll leave, then do what you want, and I don't care if you like it or not. It was time for Julia to leave. Susanna was very reluctant to let her friend go. All this time in the family they had been calm and cozy. Robert couldn't relax because Julia's mother-in-law had come to replace her. But there was nothing to do. Practice was starting, 
and the children needed supervision. Just like last time, Suzanne was sent to the same canteen for practice. Robert was luckier. This time he was sent to a restaurant for his academic success. That's where he could really learn. He loved it in the restaurant. At first he did small tasks for the chef. Then he was put on the preparation of semi-finished products for dishes. By the end of the practice, Robert was already preparing simple dishes by himself. One of the restaurant visitors even demanded to invite the chef who prepared the dish. Robert was afraid that he was about to get hit, and instead of him came out the chef himself. How amazed the guy was when he learned that the customer almost bowed at his feet for such a delicious dish. Suzanne was less fortunate. She was waiting for the role of an ordinary cook. This was the end of her culinary fantasies in the canteen. Such an experience could only drag one to the bottom. Imagine that. And Robert told his wife the story of the satisfied customer. Honestly, I envy you. I'm sick of the monotony, she told him. Robert was unrecognizable. He was so passionate about his restaurant work that he just disappeared there for days. Even though he was only supposed to have 12 hours of practice, the mother-in-law was happy to see such a change in her son-in-law. How good. Let him show what he can do. They would look at him and hire him. And in such establishments, earnings are good, she reassured her daughter. But I don't see him at all. He misses the most interesting moments in the lives of children, complained her daughter. Would it be better to disappear in the middle of nowhere and come home drunk? Is that what you think? The mother was indignant. No, but... Susanna didn't have time to insert her butt. So you know where he is, what he's doing. He'll bring home groceries and paychecks, not dirty clothes and empty bottles. Mom continued her moralizing. Practice came to an end. Suzanne and Robert defended their theses. As the mother-in-law had expected, the son-in-law was offered a job as a cook in a restaurant. Robert was glowing with happiness. Suzanne decided to stay with Rebecca until the end of her maternity leave then take the children to kindergarten and go to work. She could do what she loved at home. Besides, she already had regular customers who were hooked on her cakes. Suzanne's mom finally waited for the day of her release. The children had graduated from college and could already handle all the responsibilities on their own. With a light heart, the son-in-law sent his mother-in-law home, and so Robert brought his first paycheck. The two of them sat for a long time and just looked at that money. It was the first time in their lives that such a sum belonged to them. If it goes on like this, it will be possible to live without austerity. I can't believe it. It's all our money. Shock. Suzanne couldn't find the right words. To be more precise, it's mine, Robert replied dryly. He believed that if he earned the money, it belonged to him, and he would dispose of it as he saw fit. Susanna was very offended by his words, but she kept silent. It was her first paycheck after all. Let him spend it as he wished. If it continues to be such a salary, where will he put it? They'd have enough for their family. But although Suzanne hoped for the best, things were getting worse. Robert blended into the new team, saw them as the people he'd wanted to be his whole life. He started disappearing with his new acquaintances to bars, clubs, casinos. Susanna didn't like it. But he said you can't cut yourself off from the collective, or you won't have a life. I make the money, so I make the music. And from the family you can break away? The girl asked. Don't exaggerate. Not only do you not want to look after yourself, but you're turning into a bore, a dream, not a wife. Robert made a gesture indicating that his last words should be put in quotation marks. So, with a husband, Suzanne was essentially alone. It had been a year since her husband had started work. It had been a very difficult year, especially for her. Yes, the financial stability was there, but the relationship between them was getting cooler by the day. Suzanne had not heard a single kind word during this time, only sneers and reproaches. She was already looking after herself and began to dress nicely, but still for him remained the same gray mouse without hair and in a robe. She began to catch the eyes of other men. This confirmed that she looked not bad. Her husband was not satisfied with something all the time. We've been living in the city for several years now, and you still can't get out of your rustic image, her husband told her. Look at the local girls, at least take an example from them. Dolls. And you? He waved at her and went to sleep on the sofa in the living room. Suzanne had slept in their bed together for a year with their two children at her side. Whenever he had a chance to get close, 
he'd make some stupid excuse, just so he wouldn't have to spend time with her. Susanna naively believed him. He was tired, busy, trying to provide for his family. But it still hurt. She too was working 24 hours a day, disappearing into the kitchen. Only she managed to devote time to the children and him, and he could not. One day Suzanne complained to her friend about her life on the phone. City life in itself changes a person. And if you still manage to learn how to earn good money and tune in to the wave of the environment, then consider it gone. People sometimes change beyond recognition. Her friend tried to explain her situation. I don't want Robert to change. This change has only gotten worse so far. What should I do? cried the girl into the phone. Well, here only radical changes will help. We need to go back to the roots, to the old life. But that's unrealistic. No one wants to go back to the broken trough. Julia tried to give advice, and it's unbearable to live like this. A lump in her throat prevented Suzanne from speaking. Calm down. Let him know you're doing fine without him. You'll hurt his male ego. They get very uncomfortable when they're no longer idealized. Don't whine, but do it. Julia spoke in a high-pitched tone. Suzanne was brought to her senses by her friend's words. People wouldn't talk like that if they didn't know, and tears really can't help the grief. The girl calmed down and began to think about how to behave with her husband. The time of maternity was coming to its logical conclusion. Dakota and Rebecca had already started to go to the kindergarten. The adaptation period was designed for a month. There were no problems with Dakota. He ran to the children with pleasure and sometimes forgot even to say goodbye to his mother. Rebecca, on the other hand, was hardly torn away from Suzanne. The girl did not want to communicate with anyone, sat in the corner at the table and watched the others. She refused to eat either. Suzanne's heart was bleeding, but she understood that children must get used to socialization, to independence and to a new environment. After a month, things got better. Since there was a small age difference between Suzanne's children, it was decided that they could go to the same group. Then Rebecca calmed down and began to go to kindergarten with pleasure. The girl loved her brother very much. She was comfortable being with him anywhere. Susanna started looking for a job. She did not want to work by profession. Enough cakes and at home. She came across an ad for a job as an administrator at a children's entertainment center near her home. She had already taken her children there several times. She liked this job. Moreover, the owner allowed her to bring her children to the center for free. Gradually, Suzanne stopped dwelling on her relationship with Robert. She worked, engaged with children, baked cakes, listened to the advice of a friend and stopped reacting to the behavior of her husband. That due to his employment did not even notice such indifference of his wife. One day the landlady offered the girl a job. Her housewife was ill and no one had cleaned the apartment for two weeks. Suzanne agreed. Recently her husband completely stopped giving her money and had to rely only on herself. The landlady was satisfied with the girl's work and began to advise her friends. So Suzanne had an opportunity to work part-time. On her days off, she combined three jobs at once. It was difficult, but she liked it. Her children didn't bother her at all. They liked to help her make cakes. She encouraged them to do so. The director of the restaurant where Robert worked was strict but fair. He rewarded good work, but if someone seriously messed it up, he could even deprive them of their earnings. So everyone in the restaurant worked for a good result. The director was a widower. After the death of his wife, he raised his only daughter on his own. The girl grew up knowing no denial of anything. Any whim was fulfilled immediately. The last whim was the desire to study in Paris. The girl was interested in the restaurant business in all its manifestations. Her father was pleased with this desire of his daughter. There will be someone to leave his business. And so, finally, his favorite child returned home as a certified restaurateur. The girl's name was Margot. It was difficult to call her beautiful. Quite tall, slim build, with sharp, angular features of the face as if masculine. The restaurant workers among themselves called her a hanger. Her character was even worse than her appearance. She had nothing to humiliate a man, to trample him into the mud. But her self-esteem was very, very high. If it wasn't for her father's money, no one would want her but there was no shortage of suitors. If she liked a guy, she'd stop at nothing to get him, any way she could get him. She didn't take no for an answer and she got what she wanted. Robert had been working at the restaurant for over two years now. Six months ago, he was promoted to chef. He was making good money and spending even more. 
He got into casino gambling. Bars, clubs, and bathhouses also took most of his earnings out of his pocket. Not bad. He started having affairs on the side. Nothing serious. Just to keep up appearances. That's the high society way. Robert bought himself a used BMW. With the arrival of that car, he almost disappeared from his family's life. That morning Margot went to breakfast at her father's restaurant. It was not the only one in town, but it was the one where Robert worked. The girl sat down at a table and waved her finger at the waiter. Everyone here was afraid of her. God forbid someone should fail to please the hanger-on. You could be out of a paycheck. Margot ordered a light salad and a cup of coffee and toast. A few minutes passed and the waiter was already standing at her table with her order ready. Why are you frozen? She gave him a scornful look. The guy quickly put the order on the table and bowed out. Margot leisurely began to devour the salad. She had often ordered it at a western restaurant before, but she found this one particularly delicious. The girl waved her finger at the waiter again. I want to see whoever prepared this. She pointed her finger at the nearly empty plate. Robert stepped cautiously out of the kitchen. The chef's tunic looked good on him. He walked on shaky legs. More than once he had heard stories about the hangar, and now he was about to meet it in person. The fear of being out of a paycheck or even out of a job was clouding his mind. He stopped by the table. This dish is my creation. Allow me to introduce myself. Robert, the sous chef of this establishment. He barely managed to get the words out of his mouth. Nice to meet you, Margot. Why are you still sous chef? I would have had you a long time ago. Robert had the nerve to interrupt her speech. Demoted? No. What? On the contrary, I would have promoted you. That salad was great, Margot said with a touch of flirtatiousness in her voice. Usually when a girl is flirtatious it looks quite nice. In this situation, Robert almost threw up from her flirtatiousness. He fully realized the origin of the nickname Hanger On. He had never met a girl like this before, the sight of whom just made him sick. But this madam. The most beautiful thing about her was her father's purse. Robert thought of his own pretty wife, and he still reproached her for her bad looks. But the predator had already found her prey. Margot liked the chief very much. She noticed the ring on his finger. But that didn't matter to her. She wanted Robert, and that was it. In a couple of days, Margot knew everything about Robert, what he lived and breathed. She had no trouble making inquiries about him. She found out he had a wife and children. The wife was a simpleton. It wouldn't be too hard to get her out of the way. The children, on the other hand, would have to be considered. Margot's insistence made Robert very uneasy. Even her father's money couldn't make him pay attention to her as a woman. But she wouldn't back down. And when she invited Robert to a very expensive club, which he so dreamed of visiting, the guy gave up. For the first time ever, Robert didn't show up for a sleepover. Suzanne couldn't find a place to go. His phone had been disconnected. No matter how hard she tried to ignore her husband, she missed him terribly. She missed him. Her friend's plan didn't work. Her indifference towards her husband only resulted in him completely ignoring her. Suzanne lay awake all night. Toward morning she heard the sound of a lock opening. It felt like someone was trying to open the door and couldn't. The girl became alert. She closed the door to the room so as not to wake the children and went to the door. Who's there? Suzanne, open up. It's me. The girl hardly recognized his voice. Suzanne opened the door and Robert collapsed on the hallway floor. She had never seen him like this before. There was no way she could lift him up, so she carefully closed the door and went back to bed. And soon it was time to wake up the children, take them to daycare and go to work. Suzanne walked into the kitchen. Her husband was sitting at the table drinking coffee. What was that? His wife asked him. This is my new life, and if you are not satisfied with something you can be free, he replied. And this can suit anyone. The girl was surprised. It suits me, her husband answered reluctantly. Suzanne fed breakfast to the children, collected them and left the house. She was offended by this attitude towards herself. But she, true to herself, hoped again and again that her husband would settle down and they would live together again as a family. Meanwhile, Margot was already making plans for a future together with Robert. She asked her father to make him a chef. She should have a boyfriend the best of the best. The father fulfilled his daughter's wish unconditionally. Robert was quite happy with this state of affairs. It was the life he had dreamed of. 
Suzanne was comfortable, of course, but what could she give him? He wanted a new car, a fancy apartment, and a modern girl by his side. He didn't like Margot, but she could give him everything he dreamed of. And Margot had serious plans for Robert. She set out to destroy his family and marry him. At her age, despite her seriousness, she already wanted to have a family and children deep down in her heart. Margot began to demand from Robert to divorce his wife. He did not really want to marry her, so he argued that he could not leave his children without a father. That day Suzanne had a day off. She did not calculate the time and call it her husband. Robert, I have to pick up the kids from kindergarten. I can't make it. Robert was taking Margot shopping in his car at the time. He was very stressed by his wife's request, but he couldn't leave the kids at daycare. Margot wondered who had called him. The guy explained, It's okay, we'll pick them up. If we have to, we have to. My business is not so important compared to yours, Margot replied. Robert turned the car around and went to pick up the children from the kindergarten. Margot couldn't wait to see his children, to talk to them. Maybe then she could figure out how to get him out of the family. The teacher was already waiting for them on the playground. The children were running around her. It was clear that all the others had already been taken away. Margot scrutinized Robert's children. She introduced herself to them as an acquaintance of their daddy. The girl sat with the children in the back seat and asked them various information all the way. There was a playground outside the house and the children asked to play a little. Robert was against it. It wasn't part of his plans. Let them play, that's why they are children, Margot said condescendingly. Robert agreed. They sat down on a bench near the playground. Don't you think the kids don't look like you at all? Especially the older one. Suddenly the girl said, Come on, I was Suzanne's first man. That can't be. Robert was indignant. Well, anything can happen in life. Why do so many men trust their women so blindly? Do you think she had children for nothing? Margot stretched out. Robert put some facts together in his head. Indeed, he wasn't really sure that he was his wife's first man. And she had gotten pregnant with her first before the wedding. She'd been hanging out with her friend Edward a lot before her second pregnancy. Maybe he'd brightened her loneliness. The doubts in Robert's mind were not insignificant. Do you think so? He asked Margot. The sly beast answered confidently. And by the way, it doesn't cost anything to check it. Let's do a DNA test. It's easy. All you have to do is take a few hairs from each child's head. Robert immediately agreed. Margot said goodbye and said that she had remembered a very important matter and that she would get home on her own. Robert stayed behind to wait for his wife. He was not going to have a conversation on the subject of adultery until the examination was carried out. Soon Suzanne's figure appeared from the corner of the house. The girl came closer and literally collapsed on the bench. And where did we get so tired? Her husband asked snidely. Yes, I wanted to earn a little more money and took on cleaning two apartments. I didn't realize apartments could be so big. But there was nowhere to go. She said and sighed heavily. Well, take the kids and I've got to get to work. Ruined my plans. That's the first and last time I let myself do something like that. Her husband rebuked her. Suzanne couldn't recover from this statement for a long time. How could children spoil plans, especially since he already sees them rarely? What caused this attitude of her husband, the girl could not understand. Sighing, she took the children and went home. She needed some rest and to prepare the cake that had been ordered for tomorrow. Margot, meanwhile, was passing by the children's entertainment center, and a brilliant idea popped into her head. There are a lot of kids here. It wouldn't be hard to find a hair or two on the floor or on their clothes under the pretext that she had recently brought her daughter here, and she had lost an earring. Together with the employees of the entertainment center, she began to search. There was not the slightest doubt that the girl was telling the truth. Such a representative lady would hardly deceive. True, they didn't find the earring, but Margot found something much more important. The next day Robert brought his children's hair, and Margot immediately went to the clinic. Robert would never have guessed the switch, and deep down he was ready for it. He needed a convenient excuse to leave his family. A doctor he knew worked at the clinic. He promised to do the test as soon as possible. Margot was sure she would like the results. Satisfied with herself, she went to her father's restaurant for breakfast. For the first time in a while, Robert came home early. 
He was holding some papers and he was furious. I've spent so much time on you and you. I don't even know what to call you. Robert started the conversation by shouting, What are you talking about? Susanna was surprised. Stop playing the innocent sheep. Look at this. He handed Suzanne the results of the DNA test. The girl ran her eyes over the sheets of paper. Honestly, she didn't understand much of it. I don't understand, she said perplexed. Look, these are the numbers in bold. That's the percentage of probability that the children are from me. Robert snatched the papers from the girl's hands and throwing them on the table began to point his finger at them. Suzanne looked at these percentages, and she was puzzled. Why were they so low? The children were Robert's. That was undeniable, wasn't it? How could that be? You get it now? How could you do such a thing? I don't want to see you anymore. I'll stay in a hotel for a while. Robert said and left, slamming the door loudly. Suzanne's mind was empty and panicked, with more questions than answers. Robert, on the other hand, only said about the hotel and went to Margot's house. The girl was waiting for him because she knew how his conversation with his wife would end. Robert told her everything as it happened. Why didn't you kick her out the door? Margot wondered. I wanted to hit her. But in time I remembered about the children. It's not their fault they have such a mother, Robert replied. I don't care. I'm very glad you came, said Margot and hugged Robert. In the morning Robert left for work. Margot stayed in bed a little longer and went to visit Suzanne. She needed to clear the air. And poor Suzanne had been up all night, excused from work and hadn't taken the kids to daycare. She was devastated. She'd been wiped clean. And then the doorbell rang. Suzanne shuddered and assumed Robert had come to his senses and apologized. On the doorstep stood a spectacular young woman. Behind all the tinsel, Suzanne could see that she was naturally beautiful, with a ridiculous build, rough features, and a defiant look. Hi, my name is Margot. May I come in? She pushed Suzanne aside and entered the apartment. Hello? Suzanne could barely speak. I'm Robert's new girlfriend. He and I love each other and we're very happy. And you're in the way. It would be nice if you and your antics disappeared from his life. The uninvited guest continued. Get out! Suzanne shouted and pointed at the door. By the way, he got me pregnant. I hope we understand each other, Margot said calmly. She smirked haughtily and left the apartment, and Susanna, not thinking long, began to pack her things. She didn't want to stay in this city and in this apartment any longer. Taking the children with her, she went to work and, without explaining anything, quit her job. Wow. It turned out that her husband not only spent all the money but also made a child with some bitch. She was so wrong about him. Then Julia called and told her everything. Her friend was shocked and said that she and Edward would come and get her. By evening, Julia and Edward were already at Suzanne's. They had never seen their friend in such a state. What's the matter with you? He's not worth your little finger. You've got us. Julia comforted the girl. We won't leave you, and we'll help you with everything. Edward supported her. I don't know what I would do without you, Suzanne said, wiping away her tears. I'd just sit here and suffer, Julia said, and took Rebecca in her arms. Edward picked up two large suitcases. Suzanne took Dakota's hand and a couple of small bags. She looked around the apartment sadly and closed the door. She had always wanted to live in a big city and start a family. Who would have thought that her dream would come true and immediately crumble? On the drive to the settlement, everyone was silent. Only Julia and the kids in the back seat laughed and occasionally tugged Suzanne to look back to see how they could make faces. Mom smiled sweetly at them and then looked sadly away again. They arrived when it was already dark. Suzanne didn't want to surprise her parents overnight. Julia lived with her parents in a one-room apartment and couldn't leave her friend at her place. Edward lived alone in the small house he had inherited from his grandmother. He was afraid to ask Susanna to stay with him, but he took a chance. If you'd like to spend the night, I'd be delighted. I will, Susanna replied. Edward was happy. They drove Julia home first, then went to his house. The house looked very small, but there were four rooms inside. It was not surprising that the house had been nicely renovated. Edward had been working in a repair and construction firm for several years and had a good experience in this business. The children, without hesitating long enough, quickly separated and flew into the house with a bullet. Suzanne stood on the veranda and did not dare to enter. Why are you standing there? Come in. You are always welcome in my house. Edward said and took the things into the house. He wished that Suzanne would stay with him forever. 
he realized that tomorrow he would have to take her to his parents. Turned on the lights everywhere. The children had already found a collection of racing cars on his desk and were playing with them on the floor. Put them back where you found them, Suzanne said angrily. Let them play. Don't scold them. I still have a whole box of toys in the pantry. Only for boys, though. But I'll get some, Edward said, and went out. In a minute he was standing in front of the children with a huge box. Okay, boys, let's go to the back room, it's more spacious. You two play while Mommy and I make dinner. He winked at Susanna and took the children out. From the room came the sound of toys spilling out onto the floor. They'll turn the house upside down for you, Suzanne said guiltily. Well, let them. They're kids. But here's the problem. I don't have much to eat. I mostly eat in the canteen at work. At home, it's just a snack. That's all, said Edward. Show me where the refrigerator is. Almost commanded Suzanne. Yes, my general, Edward said, putting his palm to his forehead. Suzanne smiled. Edward missed that smile so much. He often remembered how they used to get together at recess and tell each other funny stories. Suzanne laughed so infectiously that even those who didn't get the joke started laughing too. Now he couldn't recognize this girl. Where had the sparkle in her eyes gone? Only sadness and hopelessness. Yes, here you can cook a royal dinner. Suzanne opened the refrigerator and said, Eggs, sausage, milk, vegetables. We'll have a sausage omelet and a vegetable salad for dinner. I'm already excited, said Edward. Suzanne was bustling about in the kitchen, and she was so skillful that Edward admired her every move. How beautiful she was. He could hardly contain himself from coming over and hugging her tightly. Dinner is ready. Suzanne interrupted the dreamy observation. Children, eat. The little ones came in a flash. They must have been hungry. Within seconds their plates were empty. They thanked me and ran back into the back room. Thank you for dinner. It was delicious. Homemade. Edward thanked. You're welcome. Thank you for having us here. Suzanne thanked him in return. Suzanne, you know how I feel about you. Don't reject me, please. I'm willing to wait as long as it takes. I know you're busy right now, but I'll take you and the children tomorrow. I'm not good with words. I'll try to show you how much you mean to me, Edward said, embarrassed. I know everything, and I see everything. I'll think about it. I need time now. Understand, Suzanne said, sighing. I understand, and I'm in no hurry. Come on, I'll show you where you will sleep, said Edward, and opened the door to another room. This room was larger than the others. There were two computer desks on either side of the window. There were two beds against the walls, with closets next to them. Closer to the exit was a couch and a couple of chairs. The room looked like a child's room, where children were just about to settle down. The brightly colored wallpaper and pictures on the walls reminded Suzanne of that gender party. The beds had children's bedding, one pink with princesses, the other with cars. It didn't take long for the kids to figure out who was going to sleep where. Edward laid out the couch, which was huge. Suzanne couldn't believe that she was going to sleep alone for once. Whose room is this? she asked. It's yours, Edward answered. At first there was one bed, one sofa table, one closet. I made it when you had Dakota, and then I had to add a bed, a closet, and a table when Rebecca was born. I had always waited for you in the back of my mind and hoped this day would come. Suzanne couldn't hold back her tears. In the morning Edward took her and the children to his parents' house. The girl was afraid to admit that they had been right about her husband all this time. The parents were shocked. They did not expect to see their daughter on the doorstep, especially with children and suitcases. Good morning, the girl said shyly. We're here to see you. Well, not quite good, unexpectedly said the recently awakened mother. Good, good, the father said reproachfully. For me, your arrival was expected. I was only waiting. My dear, when will you realize that this stranger is not your match? Susanna hadn't been home in years. Suddenly she felt so calm, as if she were covered with some kind of hood, protecting her from all the troubles of life. Mommy, Daddy, how stupid I was. Before she could finish, she cried. Come on, soothed her mother and continued to undress her grandchildren. You're home now. We won't let anyone hurt you. Right, Edward? Of course, Aunt Dora. Without hesitation, the boy said. Edward left for work and said he would visit Suzanne and the children often. The girl's parents packed up and left for the store. They had a large family now, and the option of just having a snack would no longer be appropriate. 
Dakota and Rebecca were playing on the big couch in the living room with their mother's old toys. Suzanne sat in the kitchen by the window and looked sadly into the distance. She was very hurt that she had been betrayed by the man she loved. She didn't understand why he had done that to her, and no one close to her understood it either. Suzanne's parents returned with full shopping bags. The grandchildren immediately ran to greet them and began to race to put everything out of the bags on the kitchen table. They were so funny at this point that no one noticed that the mountain of groceries was about to collapse from the table. And so it did. The kids guiltily stepped aside. What are you doing? Suzanne's mom asked them. No one in our house swears. Let's pick everything up off the floor, and I'll show you where to put it. Mr. Peter, Susanna's father, was strict but fair. Susanna never heard him yell. No matter how wrong his daughter was, he never once raised a hand against her. All problems were solved by long moralizing conversations. Susanna, as a schoolgirl, sometimes thought he would rather hit her, so much so that his words could strike a nerve. Mrs. Dora, Susanna's mother, was a woman of poise and kindness. She was more than just a mother to the girl, a true older friend. With her you could share anything you wanted. Suzanne never once heard a reproach or a bad word from her. Dora always tried to help her daughter and support her. Only in the moralizing of her husband she never interfered. For this Suzanne as a child very much resented her. Only growing up the girl realized why her mother did not interfere in their conversations with her father. It was because Daddy never told her off without doing anything. Edward came almost every day, bringing toys and sweets for the children and flowers for Susanna. The girl's parents really liked the guy, and Dora started talking to him once. Daughter, pay attention to Edward. He's been pining for you for a long time, and he's no match for your moral freak Robert. Mom, please, I don't need anyone right now. I want a break from relationships. Time will tell what happens next, Suzanne replied. Robert seemed good to us too, but look at what he turned out to be. He wooed beautifully too. As long as you don't get married, said father. And again Susanna recognized that Daddy, as always, was absolutely right. The only difference was that Edward was always there for her, no matter what. She realized that that was exactly the kind of man she needed around her. She couldn't sit on her parents' necks for long. Edward offered her a job at their company in the canteen. By that time, their cook had retired. Suzanne accepted. They traveled to and from work together, talking a lot. She was getting used to Edward. The children were crazy about him. She didn't understand how she hadn't been able to see so much in him before. After a while, Edward brought up the subject of their relationship again. What are we, like little children? Edward started the conversation when he brought Suzanne home after work. But tell me, is there any chance of us being together? Or am I getting my hopes up for nothing? I can't go on like this. Really, it's painful to be around you and not be able to hold you, to kiss you. It's been a long time. I understand. I think we should try to move in together. I'm very happy with you, and the kids love you," Suzanne replied, smiling. Edward was speechless from the exuberance of his feelings. When he came to his senses, he pulled her close and kissed her. I've waited so long for this. You can't imagine. I've never felt so happy. Pack your things, and you'll move in with me tomorrow. Edward's reaction made the girl smile. Yes, General. Suzanne and the children moved in with Edward. At that time, the children had already started school. Edward's house was literally a five-minute walk from their school. He had time to feed the children and take them to school before work. Suzanne didn't even have to get out of bed early. She finally felt loved. She had time to clean herself up and put on makeup. Edward, unlike Robert, understood that it took time and money to make your woman look spectacular. He tried not to deny Suzanne anything. He spoiled the children all the time, too. I feel like a princess, Suzanne said. I never thought that being a wife and mother was not a hard labor. You're not just a princess to me, you're a queen, Edward told her. Be careful, or I'll put on my crown and go looking for the king, Susanna laughed. Perhaps your majesty would like to marry me, Edward asked, keeping up Susanna's joke. I would love to, she replied coquettishly. But your title doesn't match. What if you, madam, were to take off your crown for a while? The boy asked again. But then I suppose I would have to agree. And Susanna put her arms around him and clung to him tightly. She filed for divorce. Her ex-husband never showed up at any of the court hearings. 
The whole process took months, and finally, in her hands, she had a certificate of dissolution of marriage. Without delay, Suzanne and Edward filed an application in the registry office, and in the big city, life was booming. Robert moved into Margot's apartment. It was Osab who married him after all. A year later they had a daughter Milana. The girl was a copy of her mother both outwardly and in character. At first they lived amicably partying, shopping, ball treats, easy life. And when the baby was born, Robert began to notice that Margot just uses him. She changed the usual way of life and was not going to change. The child's care fell entirely on the father's shoulders. Robert often remembered Suzanne and only now realized how hard it was for her. He had to quit his job. Margot was adamantly opposed to a nanny, and she had no time to take care of the child. At that time, Margot's father had already retired, and the whole business had fallen into her capable hands. And since Robert did not bring money into the house, his wife was not going to support him. She gave out small sums for pocket money, and no more. Unlike her father, the little daughter was doing well. She was growing up to be an insufferable child. Caprices were the order of the day. She loved only her mother because she spoiled her. Her father did not put in anything. Although the girl almost never saw her mother, and her father raised her from deepers. Margot also treated her husband like a servant. Daughter's demands grew with her, and when her father refused her something by virtue of the fact that he could not buy it for her, she screamed, I hate you. I wish you weren't in our lives at all. You're a wimp. One day Robert couldn't take it anymore and slapped his daughter. The girl complained to her mother the same day and made it sound as if she had done nothing wrong. Margot, without thinking twice, kicked her husband out the door. She didn't need him now. Her daughter was almost grown up and could stay at home alone. There was no need to look after her, and hiring a housekeeper wouldn't be a problem. She'd do the work and no one would get their hands dirty. Look at him. He's got the nerve. You should have let your hands loose with your simpleton. We don't forgive such things, but yours foolishly fell for it. Margot grinned. If she was sure you were the father of her children, why didn't you stand up for yourself? The village is uneducated. How cleverly I got you away from her. I had no trouble switching your children's hair. I've always gotten what I wanted by any means necessary. She poured her heart out, pushing Robert's suitcase out the door. Devastated, Robert went home. He had nowhere else to go. He had nothing of his own in this second family. What a fool he'd been. Trusting some girl instead of his wife, Susanna had never deceived or betrayed him. The realization of that now caused him unbearable heartache. And Dakota and Rebecca had grown up in a loving family. Their father, as they had come to call Edward, and their mother had always been supportive, making sure they never needed anything. There was never any yelling or scandal in the house. Their parents were an example to them. That's how a real family should be. After high school, Dakota went to medical school. Rebecca followed him. The boys decided to become doctors because their village lacked people of this profession. And their grandparents began to get sick. They often had to take them to the city hospital. So Dakota decided to become a surgeon and Rebecca a family doctor. It was not so far to the village, so the boys left every day to study and returned home in the evening. During this time, Edward opened his own firm for repairing apartments and hired workers. Their crew would take on any job, so they had to travel all over the state. There was very little time for his family, but no matter how tired he was, he managed to arrange family vacations. Suzanne, while she stayed home, was still baking cakes to order. There were many customers, even from other towns and cities. At first, Edward delivered the orders, but then he ran out of time, so he bought his wife a car. Suzanne got her driver's license and became a real businesswoman. But the dream of opening her own pastry shop was still just a dream. After consulting with her parents, Suzanne decided to sell her apartment in the city. She didn't want to let the tenants in. She was afraid that they would turn the place into a pigsty. She paid her rent faithfully. Once she thought that she was paying for nothing, because she didn't want to go back there for any money. And the kids were determined to settle down in the suburbs. They weren't drawn to the big city like she had been. Suzanne didn't even want to be involved in the sale, so she made a power of attorney for her mother, and Dora started looking for a buyer. The apartment was in a very nice neighborhood, and immediately there were several bidders for it. Dora drove into town. She had to clean up the apartment, gather some other things in general, to prepare the apartment for sale. 
She opened the door and was horrified. There was a pile of empty liquor bottles on and under the kitchen table. In the living room on the sofa slept, as she realized later, the former son-in-law. He still had the keys, but no one had changed the locks. Get up! She pushed him in the shoulder. He jumped up so suddenly that Dora was even frightened. Her son-in-law, sitting on the sofa, looked at her for a long time. Apparently, in such a state it was difficult to think of something immediately. What? Have you completely lost all your brains? asked Dora. Your ex-mother-in-law. Don't you recognize her? Why, yes, I recognize her. You don't forget something like that. He barely spoke. Why did you come here? To sell the apartment, the ex-mother-in-law answered. I'm the owner here too. The apartment was purchased during the marriage. I won't let you sell your part. After a little bit coming to his senses, Robert said, God be with you. Live, but be kind enough to pay us our part. And there will be no more questions, Dora replied. I have nothing to pay you, replied the man. Let your wife help you. There's a lot of money there, Dora suggested. She's not my wife anymore, understand? Robert shouted. Why are you yelling at me? The mother-in-law was outraged. Suzanne was ours. No wife. And this one is no longer our wife. That's how it is. Why don't we pay you your share? Sell the car, add on and buy yourself a place. It may not be in the center, but you'll have a roof over your head. She suggested it. Let's do it. I'll do it. Robert bellowed. Dora thought it would be a little easier. Her son-in-law had nothing to do with the apartment. He could have refused to give up his share, at least for the sake of the children. But he couldn't do anything else for the children. Suzanne had checked out of the apartment a long time ago. Only Robert remained registered, but she still didn't want to see him or discuss anything with him. Dora found the notary who had drawn up the sale agreement with her nephew a long time ago. The specialist was experienced and gave some useful advice. First Robert sold his part, and then already made a deal with a new buyer. Everything went well, but it took a long time. Dora wanted to get rid of Robert and the apartment as soon as possible. She breathed a sigh of relief when she handed the keys to the new owner. Finally there was nothing more to tie them to this town. When she got home she told her husband about her adventures. He was shocked, to say the least. Peter suggested not to tell his daughter anything, let her live in peace. She'd already been through enough because of him. And the money we spent is a trifle. The children help us a lot. We should thank them somehow. Dora agreed with her husband. The warmth and understanding in their relationship had not faded with age. Suzanne's son had already graduated from the institute and was sent to one of the city hospitals for internship. The guy rented a room and came home very rarely. There was a lot of work. His daughter continued to study and still lived with her parents. One day Suzanne decided to tell the children about their own father. More than once the children had wondered why they had different last names. Suzanne evaded the answer as best she could. The children realized that she didn't want to talk about it and stopped asking. The woman consulted Edward who approved her wish. I'll tell them everything. I think they'll understand. I can't bear to carry this around with me for so many years, Suzanne explained. Do what you think is right. I'll accept whatever they decide. They will still be my children to me. I wish I had adopted them when I did. I wish I'd never had to ask these questions. I wish we could have had children together." Edward replied with a note of regret in his voice. "'Why not?' Suzanne replied, strangely embarrassed. "'What do you mean?' Edward asked, surprised, in a very direct way. Before she could say anything her husband had already taken her in his arms and was kissing her fervently. "'I can't believe it. I'm going to be a father for the third time. Thank you, my darling, he shouted in total delight. I'm ashamed to tell my children about it. Suzanne smiled embarrassedly. It's already an age, no matter how you look at it. It's time to babysit grandchildren. And I'm going to have a baby. With Dakota, the difference will be almost 23 years, Susanna said doubtfully. Oh, come on. What are our years? Her husband reassured her. Have the baby. It can't be otherwise. It was decided to get together this weekend and hold a so-called family council. Dakota was able to get away for one day. Suzanne was looking forward to having the whole family together. Her parents were called in as well. She had no secrets from them. And bustling about in the kitchen, there was a sudden knock on the door. She wiped her hands with a towel and opened it. She didn't immediately realize who was standing in front of her. At the threshold stood a gorgeous lady with some cool guy. 
Next to them stood a little boy about six years old and, seeing Suzanne, began to hide behind his mother. She took off her sunglasses and smiled. You didn't recognize him at first? No, Julia. I'm shocked. Where have you been? Her friend said nervously. Let me in the house, I'll tell you, said Julia. This is my husband Max and my son Dennis. I'd like you to meet them. I'm sorry, of course. Come on in. Have a seat. Are you hungry? The guests refused to eat, explaining that they had only recently eaten in a restaurant. Julia began her story. She had always dreamed of becoming a model, but all attempts to realize her dream had failed. After Suzanne moved out of Robert's place, she thought that now her friend could do without her. On the internet, Julia found an ad recruiting girls with model looks for a photo shoot abroad. Julia was afraid that she could get into a bad situation, but she took a risk. The firm turned out to be reliable, licensed, and she found herself as if in a fairy tale. She made it through three qualifying rounds and ended up in the top ten. For months they traveled all over the world and filmed. Max was their photographer. There was a mutual attraction between them almost immediately, and they started living together. The last photo shoot was in Paris. They had to return to their homeland again and sign new contracts. But the young people liked Paris so much that they decided to stay. They got married. Dennis was born. They lived there for a total of ten years. It turned out that they both longed for their homeland, but needed to wait until the baby grew up. And so it's been a few days since they've been back. Maxim was originally from Washington, D.C., and he had his own apartment there. Julia's husband quickly found a job, and she herself continued to take care of the baby for the time being. Why haven't you been in touch? Suzanne asked. I don't know what to say, but I missed you very much, answered her friend. Edward came home a little while later. He was surprised to see her. Julia. Just as suddenly as she had disappeared, she had reappeared. What a surprise. Well, hello, missing person. Edward hugged Julia tightly. He met her boys, too. Julia hadn't changed much in the meantime. She was still as beautiful as ever with her modeling looks. If they didn't know her spectacular husband worked as a photographer, they would have thought he was a model, too. Suzanne's children entered the kitchen and looked at the guests with surprise. They could hardly remember Julia, so their mother briefly explained to them who these people were. Just as everyone was getting acquainted, Suzanne's parents returned. Dora recognized Julia at once and guessed that she had come with her husband and son. Good afternoon. It's nice to have the family together, said Dora. Mom, help me set the table, Suzanne asked. Julia and Rebecca also volunteered to help. Together they quickly managed to set the table and everyone sat down together. I'm here tonight, Suzanne continued. I wanted to talk to the children first and then share the good news with everyone. And it turns out you've all arrived. But that's even better. And she began her story, being careful not to leave out any important details. Julia and Dora confirmed her words from time to time. Everyone listened very attentively. That's the way I had to go to be really happy. Suzanne finished her story. The children knew that Edward was not their birth father, but they had always thought of him as their father, and they were not mistaken. It turned out that their biological father was a real scoundrel. Mom, said Dakota, our father is Edward, and we don't care that we don't have his last name. It's just a big deal. We don't need another father. We don't want to know him. Rebecca nodded in agreement, confirming her brother's words. Edward was surprised at the children's reaction. He was afraid that they would want to find their birth father and stop communicating with him as they had before. I don't care who your biological father is either, Edward said. You are my own beloved children. Thank you, Suzanne said tearfully. I am happy that my children have such a father and that I have such wonderful children. And now I have some news I want to share with everyone. Edward and I are expecting a baby, our third child. There was a look of surprise on everyone's faces. Everyone thought differently. Dakota. I hope it's a brother. Rebecca. Just wish it was a sister. Suzanne's parents. A third grandchild. The second youth will come. Mr. Peter interrupted everyone's thoughts. Here everyone remembered the situation when after a toast they had to whisper afterwards. There was loud laughter. Only Julia whispered something in her husband's ear, telling him about this curious case. 
During the entire meal, after Suzanne's story, no one else about Robert and did not remember. After the sale of his part of the apartment, he lived for a long time simply in the car. Instead of buying a place to live, he spent the money on whatever he wanted. As a result, of course, the money ran out. Robert tried to find work as a cook. It was the only thing he was good at. It turned out that Margot had done the same thing. No restaurant would hire him as soon as they found out who he was. So he started going to cafes and diners. But even here he had a fiasco. Robert, desperate, tried to reconcile with Margot and his daughter, but they did not even listen to him, chased him away. One day on the street a guy touched him on the shoulder. Hello? I see you haven't been a chef long either. I'm Victor. I got kicked out of my job because of you, he said. Robert recognized him, but he was ashamed and pretended he didn't remember Victor. What happened to you? You don't have to answer, I know. We played and threw it away, Victor said. Robert nodded silently. He didn't think about the consequences of going headlong toward his goal. He had hurt so many people for nothing. Let's go to my place, Victor suggested. I'll buy you some tea. Robert told him the whole story of his life, how he was now paying for his sins, that he himself was to blame and did not know what to do. Victor had a small burger shop on the outskirts of town. There was only one problem with the delivery of raw materials. Victor didn't have a car, and suppliers either delayed delivery or simply refused to deliver the goods so far away. And the only thing I had left was a car. Robert sighed heavily. That's great. Do you want to work for me as a courier? Victor rejoiced. I would, Robert answered. But I have no place to live. You'll survive while I have you, earn money, then rent your own place, said Victor and extended his hand to seal their agreement. Life seemed to be getting better. Robert was working his ass off. Victor was a good boss. The burger joint was starting to make a nice profit. More than three years had passed since the sale of the apartment, and this job was the first stability in Robert's life. But this stability did not bring him any pleasure. He worked like a horse and the income was small and he was wasting it at the casino or at the club. Robert didn't value his life. He didn't care where to live, how to live, what to eat, what to wear. In short, a miserable existence. Susanna's life, on the contrary, was a vibrant one, cheerful, happy. She was doing what she loved, nearby loving husband and children. It remained to realize her dream, to open a pastry shop, and she did not need more from life. Once looking at the rental ads, she found a small room in the village. It had once been a store, then a cafe, and for the last few years it had stood abandoned. There was a piece of paper taped to the window that said for rent, call on the phone. So Suzanne called. Some guy answered the phone and said the place was just for sale. The lease was no longer relevant. The price was normal. Suzanne said she would think about it and call back. She needed to consult with her husband. At dinner that evening, she told him, Edward, I've found a space for a pastry shop. Only the owner wants to sell it. He says he won't rent it out. And the price is probably too high, isn't it? Edward asked. You know, not at all. It was lower than I expected, Susanna replied. Then what's the question? Take it and don't hesitate, replied the husband. There is a small problem. It needs major repairs. The building has been derelict for several years. You know better than I do what an abandoned building looks like in our village. Suzanne replied, Who's your husband? Edward laughed. I was just so frightened when I saw the extent of the renovation that I forgot who you were. Suzanne smiled guiltily. In a couple of weeks we'll be handing over the facility and we won't be taking on any new ones for a while. We'll take care of your pastry shop. In a month I think we'll be done. Edward reassured her. Her pregnancy was going well. No toxicosis, no swelling, no mood swings this time. The doctor who had done the last ultrasound smiled and said everything was fine. No obvious pathologies and the children were revealed. Whoa. Children? Suzanne thought she heard something. What do you mean, children? She asked again. There are two embryos in the uterine cavity. They are developing according to the gestational age. They are different eggs, embryos. So we are expecting twins. The doctor explained. Suzanne did not expect such news and could not recover from the news for a long time. She drove her car to the hospital. Now she compared how difficult it had been for her before how frightening every pregnancy had been for her, and how calmly she perceived it now. It turns out it was possible to live differently. 
how circumstances can affect our way of life. The next ultrasound was in two months. The picture of the party that her friends had organized for her then popped into her head. She decided to call her friend. Julia, hi. I have a huge favor to ask of you. Can you come with me to the next ultrasound? I want to have a gender party again. Of course I can. And I'll organize it again. It's just too bad I can't bring Edward to help. That's okay, but there's Max and Dakota and Rebecca. I'm not going to be able to do it, she said, her friend said, working out a plan in her head. Thanks. I'll call you later, Suzanne said. From the hospital she went to the place where she planned to open the candy store. I took another good look around. Too bad she couldn't get inside. But through the broken windows, Suzanne already had a rough idea of where and what she was supposed to have. She immediately dialed the owner and told him she was in. The documents were all ready for the sale. The deal was finalized within a few days. It was almost a dream come true. Her husband came home late from work. Suzanne was waiting for him. Hi. Get changed. Wash your hands. We'll have dinner. Let me catch my breath. It's been a crazy day. The husband answered. Me too. Suzanne thought for a minute. Oh, by the way, you were supposed to go to the hospital today, Edward suddenly remembered. What did they say? They said the baby's fine, and I almost bought the bakery space. How did you manage to do all that? My husband marveled. Thanks to you. If it wasn't for the car, I wouldn't have gotten out much with my legs. The time for the next ultrasound was approaching. Suzanne was very anxious in anticipation of the date. She had already made arrangements with her friend in advance, changed her mind about everything. What will the ultrasound show? Who's in there? How would the others react to such news? The long-awaited day had arrived. Her friend was already waiting for Suzanne at the hospital entrance. The doctor told her that the sex of the babies had already been determined. She interrupted him and asked him to give the envelope with the results to her friend. Julia was looking forward to this moment. Already her hands were itching to organize something. Suzanne was insanely curious about what was in that secret envelope. But like the others, she had to wait for the party. Only unlike everyone else, she was the only one who knew there was a double surprise in there. And Julia opened the envelope and nearly fainted. Twins? No one would expect such a surprise. The girl took the children's photo album from her friend and gave it to Max. Max enlarged the best photos, made them on the background of fairy tale characters in blue and pink frames. Where Robert was in the photo, Julia asked her husband to replace him with something. Dakota and Rebecca were tasked with buying all sorts of goodies, but only in a given color scheme. Suzanne volunteered to bake the cakes with pink and blue cream. Edward, too, had the important task of inflating the helium balloons. Suzanne was on the road all day. She had a lot of shopping to do for her future pastry shop. She returned in the evening. Edward was at work until lunch. Then he came to get the balloons and take Rebecca and Dakota home. Julia and Max and her son were already fussing around the house, decorating the house even better than last time. Suzanne's parents arrived at the apartment. At last everyone was gathered. The table was full of sweets. Dennis, Julia's son, kept snatching candy from the table. For him, the party was a fairy tale. Julia said the first word, Edward, Susanna. You seem to be madly curious about who you are going to be the parents of. I'd like to ask you to look at the walls. There are some of your best pictures. But they have one thing in common. The frames are different colors. You're going to have to count them. Suzanne counts the pink ones, and you, Edward, the blue ones. The couple seemed to count carefully, but the score was even. They didn't count again. Julia continued. Look at our pink and blue sky and balloons. Everyone looked up at the ceiling. The balloons did make it look like the sky. Now for Mrs. Dora and Mr. Peter. As grandparents, you have to participate. Count the balloons. Julia gave the assignment. The balls were counted, 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 and came back to a tie. Something about the older generation being inattentive. Handing the next task to Dakota and Rebecca, Julia said, and poured pink and blue hearts on the floor. Counting, Dakota blue, Rebecca pink and the hearts were evenly divided. Everyone waited in bewilderment for the long-awaited denouement. It's been three contests, and the results are the same. Max, bring it in, Julia commanded. Her husband entered the room. He was holding a tray with a large cake on it. It was pink and blue, exactly in half. 
The cake was mesmerizing. There were blue flowers on the pink background and pink flowers on the blue background. Max placed the cake on the table. Cutting the cake was entrusted to the head of the household. Julia held out the knife. Edward should make the cut exactly in half. Inside will be a filling of the appropriate color. This is the final step that will reveal what gender the baby will be. Julia also did not divulge that there would be two children. Edward cut the cake exactly in the center and pulled the two pieces apart. And everyone gasped. One half of the cake was pink inside, and the other half was blue. Well, that's intriguing, isn't it? said Mrs. Dora impatiently. Suzanne was the only one who guessed that she was carrying different sex children. There was surprise on the faces of the others. They began to ask Julia to open the envelope sooner rather than later. They did, said Julia. I'll take it out. She took the ultrasound picture out of the envelope and handed it to Edward. He even cried silently. Dora snatched it from him and cried loudly, too. The others came over and saw what Julia had so successfully hidden. Only now it was clear why the score was always tied. Just like we wanted, Rebecca and Dakota said in one voice. Everyone laughed. Edward wiped away the tears of joy with his hand. I'm going to be a father of many children. I'm so happy. Suzanne, my love. What a gift. Suzanne sat there smiling, comparing Edward and Robert's reactions. It was obvious who truly loved her and treasured every day she spent with him. At the same time, Robert was driving around town making purchases for the burgers. Business was picking up. But as a rule, in a big city there are always a lot of competitors and envious people. Robert had no idea what a surprise awaited him when he brought in the groceries. During the night, the burger joint went up like a match. Thank God they didn't hire a security guard to save money. No casualties. By the time the fire was put out, all that was left of the burger house was a frame and a pile of ashes. Victor couldn't get Robert on the phone. He wouldn't pick up. He wanted to ask him not to buy groceries. On this day, Robert, as luck would have it, forgot his cell phone at home. Driving up to the burger shop, the guy did not immediately realize what had happened. Only when he got out of the car, Robert realized that life had prepared another surprise for him. Victor approached him. It started out so well and ended so sadly. I invested so much in this place, I didn't even have any money to spare. I'm not having any luck in this town, I guess. Goodbye. I want to go back to my hometown, you know, Robert said. I'm not having any luck here either. Maybe I'll go to my village too. My father's there. If he's alive, we'll live together. And if he's dead, at least I'll have a roof over my head, and maybe I'll get a job. Robert slept in Victor's apartment until evening. Then he packed up, said goodbye, and left. A sense of hopelessness clouded his mind. He wanted to get drunk, to forget himself, and with his last money he bought a bottle of cognac. Sitting in the car, Robert emptied it in a volley and passed out for a while. When he came to himself, he remembered that he was going to leave for his native village. He started the car and drove off. On the city roads you can't go around much. Traffic jam on traffic jam, but the highway was freer outside the city. Robert wanted to get away from this hateful city to leave everything bad in it and start his life from scratch. Thinking about it, he accelerated the car to a hundred. He didn't realize how he flew out on the slippery highway to the side of the road. The impact with the guardrail knocked him unconscious. There was a small ravine a little farther down. The car flipped several more times and fell on the roof. Everyone who observed this situation stopped their autos. The male drivers got out and amicably turned the car over. Behind the wheel, wearing a seatbelt, sat a drunken man. He was covered in blood. His pulse was palpable. He was wedged between the steering wheel and the seat. So, not knowing the severity of his injuries, they decided not to touch him yet and wait for the paramedics. The ambulance and police arrived at the same time. The victim was taken out and sent to the city hospital. Doctors performed a two-hour operation. The patient's condition was stably serious. After such an accident, Robert miraculously survived. He suffered a small head injury, an open leg fracture, and numerous shallow cuts. If it wasn't for his seatbelt, he'd be in the morgue instead of a hospital. After a week in intensive care, Robert was moved to a regular room. The doctor warned him that he would have to spend a couple months in the hospital. His leg was put back together in pieces. They fixed it with an apparatus and put it on a ventilator in the ward of sufferers with limb injuries. 
Mr. Dakota, a young intern physician, was in charge. After morning rounds, Robert Long remembered where he could and saw this handsome guy, but still did not remember the name of the doctor. He did not know. So he called a nurse and asked, And who is this young doctor? And this young doctor, Mr. Dakota? He will be your attending physician. He's very competent. Don't look so young, the nurse replied. Robert turned his whole life over in his head, but he couldn't remember a time when he'd encountered this guy. Still, the painfully familiar face kept him on his toes. He was also hurt by the fact that everyone was visited by relatives, bringing various goodies, and he was lying alone, unwanted by anyone. Resentment at himself was eating him up inside. Why didn't I die in that accident? He often asked himself the same question. The day of Suzanne's delivery was approaching. Suzanne could hardly walk anymore. Her stomach was so big that she could no longer fit behind the wheel of a car. If she needed to go somewhere, she called Julia. In her friend's car, the front seat was pushed to the max and wouldn't move back. You can't even control the seat, she marveled. Why? When you give birth, then I'll put it back in place, Julia answered. I don't understand you. You're going to give birth soon. Can't you sit still for the last few days? You're always going somewhere. Julia, the renovation of the pastry shop is almost finished, but there are so many nuances left you can't imagine. I haven't bought everything yet. I want to get it done before I give birth so I can hire employees, open up and just run it. With two babies, you can't run around afterwards, Suzanne said. I know that you cannot change your mind, so I keep quiet and drive everywhere. Sighing, her friend replied. Rebecca, Suzanne's daughter, was interning at the same hospital where her brother was interning. So far, she had only been assigned the role of a charge nurse. She put IVs, gave injections, monitored compliance with the regime of patients, and Dakota was once again making his rounds. He was standing by Robert's bedside, looking over the appointment sheet. And then a girl in a white coat ran up to him. Dakota, I finally found you, she said, out of breath. Mommy's been taken to the hospital. Rebecca, calm down, the young doctor replied calmly. It's just the hospital. It was worth the wait. I'll finish my rounds and we'll talk. The girl calmed down a little and, apologizing to her brother's patients, left the room. Robert watched her for a long time. She seemed familiar to him, too. Mr. Dakota, Rebecca, how do I know them? Why do you keep bugging me? The maternity hospital where Suzanne was taken was on the grounds of the hospital where her older children worked. The contractions were not yet frequent, but Edward was very worried and drove his wife to the hospital. Immediately, Suzanne was placed in the delivery room. Her husband paced nervously in the corridor. Suzanne had refused to give birth together, but Edward did not insist. If it was what was best for his wife, why resist? Dakota and Rebecca came into Mommy's room. Mommy! Rebecca rushed in for a hug. I'm so worried. And this one. She pointed to her brother. He's emotionless. Nothing will upset or frighten him. Why panic? Mom in the maternity ward is normal in her situation, Dakota replied calmly. Oh, come on. The girl waved her hand at her brother and pressed herself harder against her mother. Gradually, the contractions intensified. A nurse came in and asked the young medics to leave the room. Suzanne was wheeled away on a chair toward the delivery room. The boys went out into the hallway where Edward paced back and forth, nervously fumbling with the waistband of his lab coat. Daddy! Rebecca threw herself on his neck in tears. Mommy's been taken away. I'm so worried about her. Me too, my princess. Edward replied excitedly and stroked her head. Are you two conspiring? People, come to your senses. My mom's going into labor. She wasn't taken for organs by aliens, and she didn't fall through the ground, Dakota said with enviable calm. The waiting was tiring. Edward asked Dakota to go find out something. A couple minutes later, the boy returned. It was about time I went. Congratulations. There are two more of us now, Dakota said, smiling and wiping the sweat from his forehead. He was worried, though he didn't show it. Rebecca and Edward, sobbing, threw their arms around each other. Dakota looked at them and smiled. They were stupid. They should be happy. But they were crying. Suzanne and the children were fine. The doctors said they could be discharged in five days. Edward, Rebecca, and Dakota began preparing the house for their mother's return. Julia and her family arrived, 
bringing a lot of things, toys and knickknacks for the babies and their mom. I can see you guys did a great job. And the nursery is ready and beautiful. You bought so much stuff. Did you find a stroller for twins? Julia asked. I think I forgot. Edward scolded himself. I felt it. We didn't have enough hands. Go get another present from the trunk, Julia said. Edward obediently went to Julia's car, opened the trunk, and couldn't hold back the tears. He carried the lovely stroller into the house. It was gray and pink in color on spinning wheels with removable carriers. Despite being a double, it was quite compact. I think Suzanne would like it. It only fits through the door when disassembled, though. Thank you, Julia. I've always been amazed at you. It's like you always know what someone needs. I don't know how, Edward said. I see everything's fine. And the refrigerator. You can handle the feast without me. I'll meet you at the discharge tomorrow, Julia said businesslike, and off they went. Everyone gathered outside the hospital. Everyone was holding a bunch of balloons. Edward's car had a few bouquets on the roof. A nurse appeared in the doorway with two babies in her arms. Suzanne followed her out. Who's the daddy? The nurse asked, smiling. Take them away. It's a little hard to hold two people. Edward ran up and picked up his son and Suzanne, her daughter. They went carefully down the stairs. At that time, everyone released balloons into the sky. It was fabulously beautiful. Julia immediately took Suzanne's baby girl. But the young mother's hands were not empty for long. She struggled to carry all the flowers to the car. Robert was on the ventilator for almost a month. He was already tired of lying down. The doctor allowed him to sit up. Robert's bed was by the window overlooking the main entrance of the maternity hospital. He admired the different ways people welcomed new life. But he'd never seen anything like today. A mother with two children was being discharged. You couldn't see the sky behind the balloons. There were so many flowers that the woman in labor could hardly carry them. Suddenly he recognized his attending physician and this girl who was talking to him. As the woman in labor put the flowers into the car, she turned involuntarily toward the window from which Robert was looking. The man jumped out of bed like a scalded man. He recognized his first wife, Suzanne. He looked closer and saw Edward and Julia and Suzanne's parents. So that's how I know this guy and this girl, Robert said out loud, involuntarily. He wanted to jump up and run to them but he realized that after all his quirks, no one would be happy to see him there. He decided to wait until morning rounds and try to talk to Dakota. Suzanne was very happy that she was finally home. Everyone had been making great preparations to see her. The house was beautifully decorated. The table was bursting with abundance. In the nursery, there was no room for an apple to fall. Her eyes fell on the stroller. My God, what a beauty, she exclaimed. I've never even seen one of these on TV. Suzanne sat at the table for a while. She looked very tired, so she said goodbye to everyone and went into the children's room. Dora followed her. The rest of the guests stayed and discussed the day and shared their impressions. Daughter, age takes its toll, said Suzanne's mother. The older we get, the weaker the body, and it becomes difficult for him to cope not only with illness. I think you know what I mean. Of course I do, Mom, Suzanne answered. Very difficult. Can you move in with me for a little while? I've been going through a lot without you. If it weren't for you, I don't know how I would have raised Dakota and Rebecca. I will. But I'm not the helper I used to be, says Mom. Suzanne. Julia called out in a whisper and looked out the door. Everyone's wondering what the babies are called. Lara and Ben. Suzanne replied with a smile. Julia left. Dora looked after the babies and Suzanne dozed off in her chair. Her mother looked at her sleeping adult daughter with a pang. How much she had to go through to be happy. The days flew by in the care of the children. Suzanne gradually recovered from childbirth and began to prepare for the opening of the pastry shop. She thought about it all the time. The room was quite large, so Suzanne decided to open a small coffee shop there so that visitors could not only buy something to take with them, but sit down and have tea or coffee with a cake. The opening was just days away. Suzanne had already found employees. It wasn't difficult. She went to the college where she herself had once studied, and they recommended several candidates. Julia agreed to be the administrator at first. Almost everything was already in place. Only Suzanne could not think of a name for the pastry shop. There were a lot of options in her head, but not the right one. 
She was going to go to the pastry shop to talk to the staff, to distribute the duties and once again to check everything well. She was surprised to see a gorgeous, glowing sign above the entrance. The Road to Happiness. Around the sign were colorful donuts, pastries, and mini cakes. Suzanne guessed that Edward had done it. He'd seen how hard it was for her to come up with a name, so he'd decided to help. Suzanne was grateful to him for that. She was about to call her place just a pastry shop, and he had hit ten. Robert couldn't wait until morning. He'd been thinking all night about how he would start his conversation with his son. He didn't know how the boy would react, so it was necessary to start somehow from afar. Dakota entered the room. He talked to the other patients first, then it was Robert's turn. You need to have your leg scanned today. Let's see how it's healing, said the young doctor. After rounds, I'll come back to see you. We'll schedule an x-ray based on the test results. Okay, Robert nodded. This was good for him. It was better to talk alone than in front of everyone in the room, especially since the x-ray room was on a different floor and at the other end of the building. There was plenty of time to talk to his son. Dakota and a nurse with a wheelchair appeared in the doorway of the room. Are you ready? Have a seat. And go. If the scans are positive, maybe we can take that iron structure off your leg. Dakota left the room with the patient and walked with him toward the elevator. They had to go from the second to the fourth floor. He was going to see the finished scans right away. You know, doctor. Robert turned to him. At first I thought I saw you somewhere. Then the girl Rebecca came up to you and looked familiar to me too. I couldn't remember where I'd seen you for a long time. Yesterday I sat by the window and watched a woman in labor being discharged from the hospital. I like to watch the process. It's very interesting. Everyone is greeted differently, but I've never seen such a celebration as this woman was given yesterday. I even stood up to get a closer look and saw that the woman in labor was my first wife. I recognized her parents, her friends, and I remembered why I was so familiar with your and Rebecca's facial features. I'm your birth father. Dakota stopped in the middle of the long hallway. For the first time in his adult life, he could barely contain his emotions. He wanted to leave this patient right here and run away. Tears of resentment for his mom, for his sister, and for himself. This man had caused so much pain. And now, after all these years, he remembered them. But my natural composure, which helped me a lot in my work, took over my sensitivity again. I'm sorry, but I don't know you and I don't want to know you. I don't care who my biological father is. I have a great dad, and I don't need another. I love him and I'm grateful to him for everything in my life. But don't take it out on me, please. I want to make things right, Robert asked. You should have thought of that before. Rather rudely replied the guy and dragged the wheelchair to the x-ray room. And he himself remained waiting in the corridor. He didn't go with the patient. Leaning against the wall, he squatted on it, put his elbows on his knees and covered his face with his hands. Doctor, are you ill? He heard a concerned girl's voice nearby. Dakota woke up, stood up quickly. In front of him stood a pretty girl in a white robe over a jacket. He read the name, Ms. Eileen, cardiologist. No, I'm fine. Just had a rough tour of duty, Dakota answered. And my name is Eileen. I work here too. She held out her hand. Dakota squeezed her hand lightly and immediately sank into her soft blue eyes. He liked the cardiologist very much. Dakota. I'm still an intern. It's very nice to meet you, the young doctor replied casually. May I take you to lunch? The girl was dumbfounded by such boldness. The guy seemed shy at first. Dakota noticed her surprise. I'm sorry. I just don't know how to hide my desires. I didn't want to seem insolent. Already shy, the guy answered the girl's mute question. It's okay. No one has ever asked me to dinner just like that, she answered. I agree. At that time, the pseudo-father was taken out of the x-ray room. Robert stayed waiting in the hallway, and Dakota went in to talk to the radiologist. On the way back, both were silent, each thinking about his own thoughts. Already in the room, Dakota turned to Robert. Don't get your hopes up. You're just an ordinary patient to me, like many others, and nothing more. But Robert wanted to say something. Dakota gestured, Quiet. People are sleeping and he left the room. Robert was left to reap the rewards of his reckless life. He thought that if he was discharged, he would find Suzanne and beg her and the children for forgiveness.
Dakota came back into the room. He went to Robert, who was lying staring at the ceiling. The young doctor leaned over to him and said in a whisper, And yes, I forgot to say. Forget we exist. You've done enough damage to us already. If I find out you're looking for a meeting with us, I won't vouch for myself. And he slammed his fist lightly on the bed. Robert even flinched in surprise. He couldn't reply. He only looked at his adult son with a dumbfounded look. The day of the opening of the pastry shop had arrived. The entrance to the premises was decorated, music was playing, all relatives, acquaintances, and residents of the village gathered. It had been a long time since they had had an event like this. Today Suzanne prepared free treats for everyone, small cakes and various drinks. The workers of the pastry shop brought tables outside, put on them trays with sweets and trays with tea, coffee, and juice. There were two large coolers and disposable cups for those who just wanted to drink water. The opening celebration was a success. Everyone left satisfied, thanked the owner, and vowed to become regular customers. The confectionery was gaining popularity. People from neighboring residential areas began to come for sweets. Suzanne hired Julia's husband as a staff member. He was responsible for advertising, fulfilling social networks, and the website of the pastry shop with content. Julia took orders and Max made sure they were delivered to the customers. The pastry shop employed three pastry chefs, all graduates of the local college. The guys, who had almost no experience, created masterpieces of confectionery art under their supervision. The fame of their skills quickly spread throughout the state. There was no shortage of customers. Soon Suzanne had to build additional bakery shops and expand the coffee shop space. Suzanne trusted her friend completely, so she was able to take two days off a week to spend time with her family. On such days they either gathered at home for a family dinner, or spent the whole day driving around the city, visiting various entertainment centers, shopping. On her regular day off, Suzanne was expecting everyone for dinner. The table was set, the babies were crawling around, but not bothering anyone at all. Lara and Ben were surprisingly quiet children. Dora handled them quietly on her own. Dakota and Rebecca were the first to arrive. They were followed by Mrs. Dora and Mr. Peter. Edward was the only one waiting. He called to say he would be a little late. It was not their custom to start a family dinner if any member of the family was absent. Edward appeared at the door. He was holding three huge bouquets of roses for his wife, mother-in-law, and oldest daughter. In another he held two large stuffed toys, a pink bunny and a brown bear. And there was something else in a small bag. Dakota and Peter looked at Edward expectantly. They wanted something for themselves. Okay, Edward said. I'm so lucky to have you all. We had a big handover today, and I decided to give everyone gifts. Bouquets for the lovely ladies. There's a full day spa membership inside. A bunny for Lara, a bear for Ben. Dear father-in-law, you've been giving up a lot lately. A trip to a sanatorium for you, to improve your health. There was something else in the bag next to the voucher. Dakota realized that he was the only one without a gift, and smiled, waiting for his father to pull out a bottle of good liquor. But Edward stuck his hand in the bag and continued. Dakota, son, how much longer are you and Rebecca going to be jostling for public transportation? We don't always get to take you either. Here's your car keys. It's an inexpensive model, but it still wheels, for the first time, until you can afford a new one. Just don't forget about your sister. Dad. Dakota gave Edward a big hug. After dinner, Dakota quietly asked his mother to step aside so he could talk to her. Told her who he had to treat and the dialogue they had. He shared his worries with his mother. What if he had done something wrong? He also told her that he had met a beautiful girl. She works at their hospital as a cardiologist. Son, you did the right thing. You gotta cut out all the pain and trouble in your life. I've put my past life behind me like a nightmare. I wouldn't want to see anything or anyone reminding me of it either. There should only be room for the good things in life. And about your father. That's something you have to decide for yourself. It's your life. Dakota calmed down and hugged his mother. She asked her son not to tell anyone else about it. Why bring up the past? She hoped Robert would have the sense not to disturb them any more, and the mother and son returned to the others. Do you have any secrets from us? Edward asked. No, Susanna answered. It's just that our boy has a girlfriend. He didn't know how to tell everyone. He asked me for help. Everyone began to congratulate Dakota, 
asking about his girlfriend. He was raving about her. It was obvious that the guy was very much in love. That night, everyone stayed with Suzanne and Edward. They were so engrossed in talking about everything that they didn't even notice the clock strike midnight. Everyone was happy in their own way. There was only one person in the family who wasn't happy. That was Robert. He checked out of the hospital and drove to the settlement. After a difficult conversation with his son, his plans changed dramatically. While still in the hospital, he found his mother on social networks, wrote to her, told her the whole story of his life. She was currently living in Italy and invited him to move in with her. Robert agreed, but he couldn't leave without saying goodbye to his father. He found his house, the one that seemed abandoned. By all accounts, it was obvious that no one had lived in the house for a long time. Robert learned from a neighbor that his father had died five years ago. What a son. In all that time, he had never even once thought of his father. It turned out that he himself was just like his father. All he cared about was his own happiness. But in the meaningless pursuit of a good life, he lost everything that could make it truly happy. He had hurt those who truly loved him. And Robert finally realized his mistakes. But it was too late to change anything. He walked around the house for a while, taking a few pictures, some small things for keepsakes. Telling the neighbor that she could do whatever she wanted with the house, he went out the gate. As he left, he looked back, and a stingy male tear involuntarily rolled down his cheek. That's how life puts everything and everyone in their place, and everyone gets what he deserves, and everyone gets exactly what he deserves.